thank you very much for your welcome. And uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be in Hong Kong again, second time, and uh, speak here and teach at Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. <clears throat> I am not an educationist, but I'm interested in education. And I would like to start with very simple understanding of the word education. What is the meaning of the word education? We have, I think, forgotten it. We are treating our children or students in the universities like this as if they are empty baskets. And we are to fill that basket with a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, a lot of ideas, and so on. But the meaning of the word education is not to fill an empty bucket. The meaning of education is to bring out what is in there. Educare, the word, Latin word educare, is to lead out, to bring out what is in the child, in the person. So education never stops at school or university. Education is a lifelong process. And you are all the time learning to bring out what is inside you. Now, this is a very profound word. It's a very profound meaning. Just on this word and the meaning of this word, you can write a whole book. How in your whole life you are going to bring out what is inside you. So I generally give example that a student, a learner, is not an empty basket or a bucket, but a seed. Now, if you look at an apple seed, it's a very tiny seed. Welcome. <laughs> from Beijing. <laughs> Professor has traveled a long way from Beijing. I was your guest last year at your university, so I remember our meeting. So thank you for it's coming. Right. It's all right. <laughs> I've just started. <laughs> so um, I started to speak about the meaning of the word education. And uh, I was thinking that take a seed, for example, an apple seed, tiny apple seed, small, so bitter that you can't eat it. And if it, by chance, mistake, it comes between your teeth, you don't like it, you spit it out. If you break that seed, there's nothing in it to your two eyes. But if you imagine properly, the whole tree is in that seed. And not only the whole tree in that seed, but thousands upon thousands of apples, year after year after year, for 50 years, which will come out of that tiny seed. Now, the work of a gardener or an orchard keeper is not to tell the seed how to become an apple tree. And this is what mostly our teachers are doing. The work of a gardener and orchard keeper is to provide right conditions, good soil, good water, good sunshine, good steak, a little fence maybe, protection, so that that seed can develop into a tree. What this orchard keeper is doing, loving the seed, caring for the seed, devoting himself or herself to the seed. Now for me, this is a very simple but very beautiful metaphor for education. 
every child, and for that matter, every human being, each and every one of us, are born with a potential. Like every seed has a potential. An acorn has potential to become a mighty oak tree. So each and every one of us have come here with our own particular potential. And hopefully, we get some help from schools, from our teachers, from our colleges, from our universities, from our parents. Hopefully, we get some help, like an orchard keeper helps a seed. Of course, in the rainforest, you don't need an orchard keeper. If you are born in a tribal society, perhaps you will not need colleges and universities. The whole universe will be your university. Your whole natural world will be your book of nature. <coughs> However, we are in this civilized world, so hopefully our teachers and our parents will help us to follow a journey, go on a journey of adventure, to discover ourselves who we are. Education is a journey of self-realization, nothing less. What we have turned education into, and we are spending millions upon millions, if not billions of dollars and pounds and yens and euros and what not, on building these great universities. But what, what, we have, what we have done, we have reduced the meaning of education to getting a degree, passing the exam, so that you can go and find a job in an office, sit in front of a computer. We are given no idea that you are born in this world with a particular potential. And what is that your potential is your journey, to discover, to find out. So this is, this is the meaning that I want you to remember when you are thinking about holistic education. Now, we are born in this body, beautiful body, amazing architecture of this body, amazing, magical, mysterious design of this body, what we have in this body? We have brain, mind. Mind is bigger than brain. Mind permeates throughout the body, but bone, brain generally is somewhere in our head or in our glands. But we are born with brain, with mind, with heart, with imagination, with creativity. And then we go to university and say, no, no, your body, rest of your body is just a vehicle, maybe, an excuse to look after your head. So our education has been reduced to learning what in England we call, I don't know, the British colonial time also influenced Hong Kong education. But in Britain, they say the purpose of education and the responsibility of the schools and the teachers is to teach three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. And those three R's are learned through your head. So your imagination, your creativity, your soul, your spirit, your heart, your mind, they're all and your hands and your body are all irrelevant to our education. Our education's main purpose is to train your brain, teach your head, head education, how to read, how to write, and how to add. They are not actually three R's. Arithmetic is, is not spelled with R. 
but uh, never mind. Now, if you want to, uh, if you want to focus on holistic education, then we have to replace three R's with three H's. We have to, or maybe four H's, or many more H's, but to start with three H's. We have to educate our head, of course. I'm not against learning, reading, writing, arithmetic, writing books, all that is fine, no problem. But that's not enough. We need to also educate our heart. Head, heart, and also we need to educate our hands. Because if your heart is not trained, not educated, not developed, how are you going to deal with any relationships in your life? And the key to our life is relationships. We are not like René Descartes, the French philosopher said, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. That was a completely misguided philosophy of materialistic, dualistic kind. We are members of, or, or part of, the web of relationships. I don't live in my head. I live in my relationships. I'm speaking to you not just because I have some ideas in your head, but because you are here, the audience is here. I'm speaking because my teachers taught me something. I'm speaking to you because my mother and father brought me in this world. I'm here because the soil, the earth, Mother Earth, has been holding me on her body and feeding me with food, and the air, and the water, and the sunshine, and the ancestors. So I am not just head. I am an amalgam of relationships. Once I met a great uh, philosopher called Gregory Bateson, and he said to me, Satish, what do you have on your hand? You have five fingers? I said, what a question. This great philosopher asking me, you have five fingers? I said, yes, of course, I have five fingers. He said, no, Satish, you don't have five fingers. I said, what do you mean? One, two, three, four, at least I can count five. There are five fingers. He said, no, you don't have five fingers. What do I have? He said, you have four relationships. What a beautiful metaphor. In a nutshell, he was trying to teach me that everything is based in relationships. How are you going to deal with relationships with your friends, with your parents, with your, with your wife, with your children, with your natural surrounding, with your trees, with the animals and birds around you? How are you going to deal with the day-to-day -day relationship in the world? If schools don't help you to develop that aspect of your life, the universities don't pay any attention to this aspect of our lives, then education is not enough. It's not complete. So we need to train our heart how we can feel compassion, how can we feel love, how can we feel generosity, even how we can deal with sorrow and loss and any other negative feelings that we might face in our lives. Education has to be part of it. And then, I mean, I can go on just talking about educational heart, whole lecture, but I will move for, for further because we are going to talk about whole being. Hence, <coughs> our schools and universities are producing thousands upon thousands of young people completely de-skilled. I was recently reading in a, a British newspaper that 
15% of graduates coming out of the sixth form college and coming into universities, 15% of them don't know how to boil an egg. <laughs> we do not know anything other than maybe how to use a mobile phone <laughs> or how to use a computer keyboard. Hands are a magical gift to us. <clears throat> Through these hands, with our heart and imagination, coordinated, we can transform ourselves and we can transform any material we touch. We can take a piece of clay and with these two hands, we can turn it into a beautiful pot. We can take a piece of stone or metal and we can turn to a beautiful sculpture. You can sow the seeds in the ground, put some compost with your hands, and water the seed with your hands, and see that seed grow into a tree. If we do not teach our young people to use their hands, what is good of just using your mobile phones and computer keyboard? I'm not against technology. I'm not against mobile phone or computers. If you want to use them, good luck to you. <laughs> but that is not enough. You are not going to discover yourself who you are, the true meaning of the word education. You are not going to get self-realization and be who you are if you don't develop your heart skills, if you don't develop your hand skills, if you don't develop your creativity and imagination, you are just coming out of the university and looking for a job, you are missing out. So simple. This is not a big science or big philosophy that I'm talking to you. I'm talking so common sense. Unfortunately, common sense is no longer common. <laughs> that I have to speak these very elementary ideas. And so what we need is to realize who we are. There was a great, another great philosopher this time Indian philosopher, called Ananda Kumara Swami. And he said a very beautiful sentence, which really st stuck in my memory. He said, an artist is not a special kind of person, but every person is a special kind of artist. We are all artists. And the greatest art is not painting a picture or building a house or singing a song or dancing on the stage. The greatest art is art of living. And all the other arts, dance, music, painting, sculpturing, architecture, gardening, cooking, making clothes, making shoes, all the other arts, and they're all arts and crafts. And I don't make a big distinction between the arts and the crafts. They are twin sisters. They go side by side. An artist has to be a craftsperson, and a craftsperson has to be also an artist. If you have imagination and creativity, and you are using your hands, you are coordinating your hands with your, with your imagination, then you are an artist and a craftsperson together. So we are all potentially artists. But our education does not only not help us to bring out our true artist, it actually discourages. Education really plays a negative role of dampening down, suppressing, and conditioning our mind that the only, only way you can succeed in your life is to get a good job. That's your success. 
get a few papers published, get a few names, a bit of fame, maybe something reported about you in the newspaper or your book is reviewed. So minimal, extremely minimal. So we need to have a broader, a bigger picture of education. And education is for self-realization. And self-realization is not returning into the self, but bringing self out of the self. If the seed is remain only within itself, and you put it on the mental shelf, and put a candle around it, and a little lamp beside it, and worship it, that seed will never be a tree. It has to come out. And the apple is successful and self-realized only when that apple tree is able to feed everyone who comes to it. Unconditionally, the apple tree never has any condition. If you want to learn about unconditional love, unconditional giving, unconditional generosity. There's no better teacher, and I'm sure there are wonderful teachers in this room whom I honor, but there's no greater teacher to teach you the unconditional compassion than an apple tree or a, or a tree. You go to an apple tree, I mean, this is in England, uh, autumn, and uh, I, I'm living in England, so I only know what is happening there. I don't know what fruit you are growing here. But at this moment, we have apples galore. And I'm talking more about apples because I'm a, a small orchard keeper myself. I have 15 apple trees. And uh, every week, I'm making apple juice <laughs> with a, a hand press. So. Uh, and if you have not drunk the real, freshly squeezed apple juice, you don't know what really apple juice tastes like. You have to try it. It's nectar. It's out of this world. The taste is something you cannot imagine how delicious it is. So if you go to an apple tree, it never asks you, have you come with your Visa card <laughs> or American Express card? It gives you apples without any charge, without any discrimination, without any condition, whether you are poor or rich, never mind, or a saint or a sinner, never mind, you have apples. You are a human or a bird, never mind, a wasp, a bee, never mind, have apples. What a generosity. What unconditional giving. Now, we can learn that by studying nature. Our universities and our schools have no time for nature. What we study about nature, about nature. About nature, not from nature. And when you are studying about nature, mostly because you don't want to go out in nature because it's a bit too cold or too rainy or too wet or too messy or too unclean or why? I can watch nature on television. <laughs> I can Google trees. <laughs> you cannot learn about nature by looking at a screen or in a pretty beautifully illustrated Marvelous pictures they may be, but that's not the real learning. You have to be in the nature. In, when you go and walk along the river, or walk by the sea, or you go in the forest, like the botanical garden, Kaduri Farm and a botanical garden, and you walk uphill, and the experience you have, our universities and schools are filling us with knowledge, but depriving us from the experience. And knowledge without experience is incomplete. When you know something in your head, but when you experience it, 
in your body, in your heart, in your senses, through your eyes, through your smell, through your taste, through touching. You experience it. Your knowledge is truly realized, enhanced, completed. Because you have created a relationship. It's not a study of object there. And nature has been turned into an object, an object of study. I want to, I want to know about nature so that how I can exploit nature for my benefit. How I can conquer nature. That has been the, the project of many, many schools and universities of our modern era. How to conquer nature. How to control nature. Science, technology, and many, many other, other disciplines have been busy at knowing nature so that they can control it. They can conquer it. They can use it. We have been given this idea that somehow human beings are so wonderful and so special that we can exploit the rest of the natural world for our benefit, for our use. We can do what we like, as if the, this is a kind of human imperialism. We are the rulers of the world, and all the other species, minus human species, are almost our slaves. They are at our service. They have to meet the human needs. That's, that has been the project of industrial economic growth, unlimited economic growth. I think if you are looking for truly sustainable, holistic education, that world view of conquering nature has to be challenged. And we have to replace that view with living in partnership with nature, living in relationship with nature. All the species upon this earth are our kith and kin. In Sanskrit, in Indian philosophy, we say, Vasudhaiva kutumbakam. The whole earth is our family. The whole earth is our community. The earth community is the primary community. And all the species on this earth are our kith and kin, our friends. We are in partnership. We are in relationship with all the natural world. And in that relationship, we give and we take. It's a reciprocity. Reciprocity is the most fundamental principle in the universe. And so, but at this moment, there's no reciprocity. Humans take, 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 and give very little. And what they give is pollution, <laughs> and climate change, and global warming. So, this is, this was the philosophy which was behind uh, many great uh, uh, philosophers and thinkers, and Mahatma Gandhi started a school, a number of schools in India, on these principles. Rabindranath Tagore, who was a great poet in India, he started his school on these principles. And he started his school, he held classes under the trees. He said to his children, pupils, you have two teachers. One, human teacher, myself, but the other is this great tree. The tree is your teacher. And my mother used to go even further than that. She used to say that nature is the greatest teacher, even greater than the Buddha. And I used to say to my mother, mother, that can't be true, because in India we think Buddha is the greatest teacher. There's nobody can be greater than the Buddha. How can you challenge that? Then my mother would say, but dear boy, where did Buddha get his enlightenment? <laughs> While sitting under a tree. And nowadays we don't get any enlightenment because we don't sit under a tree. <laughs> and so what he learned from nature, what he learned from tree, how the clouds and the sunshine and the birds and the soil, how everything is connected, how everything is related. Everything is related and connected. 
that interdependence, that interconnectedness, that reciprocity that Buddha learned, and he coined the phrase um, a codependent arising. Everything arises dependent on each other. That codependent, that interdependence, the fundamental Buddhist philosophy comes from that interdependence of all living beings. And that's why the, the greatest teaching of the Buddha is compassion. Because we are all interrelated, we are all interbeings, as Thich Nhat Hanh teaches, all, we are all interbeings, so we have to be compassionate to each other. Will you not be compassionate to your children? Will you not be compassionate to your parents? Will you not be compassionate to your friends? Because you are related to them. In the same way, if we are related to all living beings, we have to be compassionate to all living beings. And when we receive gifts from nature, from life, like apples, and other food, and clothes, and wood, and houses, everything, we say, thank you, Mother Earth. We don't take it as if it was our right to take it. We take it as a matter of gratitude. With gratitude, we say, thank you. Thank you, nature. Thank you, sun. Thank you, rain. Thank you, soil, for producing this food. Thank you, gardener. Thank you, even earthworms. If there were no earthworms working under the soil, there would be no food. So I always say, long live the earthworms. <laughs> thank you, earthworms. And thank you, the gardeners. And thank you, the cook. And thank you, the host. Thank you, the guests. With that gratitude all around, I take this food. And only what is my real need. Wholesome food, I'll talk about it tomorrow, about food, but wholesome food, I take it, what is, I need, what is my need? And no more, and no waste. That is fundamental to education. So education has to be liberated from this narrow thinking of books and, and computers and, and books and computers and whatever else, screen, television screen. And it has to go out in nature, in community, the human community and the nature community. If we can go out and bring that knowledge with us, then you leave university. And recently I was in Bhutan. The Bhutan, Bhutanese government is on a wonderful path of not gross domestic product, not gross national product, but gross national happiness, GNP. Not GNP, but GNH, Gross National Happiness. And I was speaking in a university in, in uh, Timpu, and the students asked me, what do you advise us for education for happiness? When we leave university, what we should be doing? I said, I have a very small but bit provocative suggestion. What is your suggestion? I said, when you leave university, don't seek a job. And they said, what do you mean? How can we live without having a job? We have to have a job, otherwise, what's the point of going to university? I said, that's the, my point. You are not going to university to get a job. Leave your university and create your job. But in Buddhist language, we say, create your livelihood. And the livelihood is a great deal of different than job, employment. When you become the employee of somebody, then you have to follow the orders of the employer, more or less. Because you cannot be really your own creator. You cannot follow your own heart and your, your own imagination. I mean, sometimes there are wonderful employers, and they will allow your freedom to use your imagination. But if you work in factories and offices and big corporations and big banks, they are rule-bound. The bigger the corporation, bigger the organization, bigger the bank, bigger the rules, rule book, thick rule books. <laughs> and you have to follow the rules. When will you have a chance to develop your own spiritual and your own ethical, and your own imaginative, and your own artistic self? And so I said to students, go and create your job. Create your livelihood. 
be your own master. Do not serve any other master than the greatest master. And the, actually, that greatest master is in your heart. So follow your heart. Create your job. Our education should be to make young people self-reliant. University graduates should come out and say, oh, now I know how to live. Now I know what to do. I have been well equipped. I have been well trained. I'm well educated. Now I can go in the world and live my life happily and joyfully and not look for, please give me a job. One job, 200 applications. Oh, nobody gives me a job. I'm unemployed. What's good of that university which has made you so ill-equipped that you cannot create a job? So that's the greatest challenge for University of Hong Kong and University of Beijing and University of uh, London and, and Harvard and Cambridge. Challenge is that rather than uh, producing ill-equipped young people, equip them with imagination, creativity, skills, ideas, heart, relationship. They will go out in the world and be joyful and happy. But today, our university graduates come out and make a mess of the world. The biggest problems in our world are created by highly educated people. <laughs> Who took us, I'm talking about England, how, who took us to war in Iraq? Tony Blair. Do you know where he went to university? Oxford. <laughs> What's good of such a university where you lead 100,000 killed in Iraq? And who was the other partner? Mr. Bush. <laughs> where he went? Yale University. Very famous, very big. So it is not enough to be educated in universities. You have to ask what kind of education you are getting. Are you getting education to enhance the world, to make the world beautiful, to make the world peaceful, to make the world joyful? Or are you going to make a mess of the world, of economy, of war, of peace, or many, many other things? I mean, who runs World Bank? Who runs IMF? Who is the finance minister of Greece? Highly educated. Who is the finance minister of of um, Portugal and, and Italy. And who is the finance minister of uh, United States of America? $14 trillion debt. And they say, we are the biggest economy in the world. We spend $700 billion on our military. What's good of that? If you are in debt and they are asking China to bail them out. <laughs> what kind of education we have created? So we have to ask some searching questions. And I'm being candid and open to you. I'm speaking from my heart. There's no point in mixing and, and, and sort of hedging my bet. I want to speak to you that we need a revolution in our educational system so that our graduates who come from the university go out in the world and make the world a beautiful place to live as much as possible. And not this mess, messing economy, messing environment, no peace, economic problem, Peace and war problem, poverty problem, uh, all these problems we face today. If education cannot take responsibility and lead to solve these problems, who is going to take those responsibilities? So it is a great challenge for us. And so holistic education is to take up that challenge and redesign our educational system in such a way that it's holistic, it's whole your body, your mind, your brain, your head, your heart, your hands, your whole body, and your relationships with the world, then I think we can create a new kind of education. Thank you very much.